Take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me, please, to the book of Jonah. Jonah, over in the Old Testament, minor prophet Jonah. Thank you for that beautiful singing. Amen. I thank God for what I missed growing up. Amen. I missed out on all the partying. I missed out on all the getting in trouble and getting arrested. I got missed out on all them free phone calls, that one free phone call. Missed out on all that. 47 years old, never smoked a cigarette, never tasted alcohol, got married a virgin, my wife got married a virgin. We missed out on all kind of stuff. My goodness, I thank God for it too. And you young people, amen, you ought to thank God for stuff you've missed out on, amen. Amen. Jonah, are you there? Jonah chapter number three. Stand with me, please. The Bible says in verse one, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let him not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them and did it not. I want to preach tonight on this thought, why God spared Nineveh. Why God spared Nineveh. Lord, we ask you now to help us as we expound the scriptures. May it come alive, I pray. Lord, as we just go right down through this chapter we've just read and as we, Lord, extract the truths that we find hidden in the word of God, may the people of God tonight be stirred, challenged, encouraged, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Several times in this short book, four chapters, we find Nineveh described as that great city. It's called a great city in chapter one and verse number two, where God said, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Then in chapter three, it's described as a great city again. In verse number three, we've just read that it was an exceeding great city. And then again, at the end of the book, the Bible tells us in chapter four, verse 11, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city. And so several times in this book, we see Nineveh is referred to as a great city. By way of introduction, I want to give you just a couple things. These won't be on the screen, but just a couple things. First of all, Nineveh was a place that was great in size. The Bible tells us in chapter 3, in verse number 3, that Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And I don't care which set of commentaries you read or what Bible scholar you read behind, they all agree that what that meant was it took three days to walk from one side of Nineveh to the other. It was approximately 60 miles wide. Now that's a big city. That's a big city. I mean, you think about Baltimore. Baltimore's a pretty good sized city. Uh, you, I lived in Atlanta for many years and man, when the traffic was just right, it'd take you a while to go from one end of Atlanta to the other, but for Nineveh to be in Bible days, a city of three days journey, that's a big city. And uh, of course, the Bible tells us in verse four, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And so we understand that he walked about a day deep into a city that would take three days to walk through. So he kind of walked down towards the heart of the city when he began preaching, but it was great in size. Secondly, Nineveh was great in its sinfulness. The Bible tells us in chapter number one and verse number two, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. So Nineveh was known in that day as a very wicked and ungodly city which let's just be honest, most big cities are. I don't know that it could be said of any great city 
that it's a holy or a godly place. For some reason or another, that's where all the crime and all the sin and all the corruption just seems to fester and blossom. But uh, the city of Nineveh was no different in that it was great in its sinfulness. But then thirdly, it was great in the souls that were in that city. The Bible tells us in chapter four and verse number 11, God referred to Nineveh as he was talking to Jonah. He said, why should I not spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And most Bible students agree that what he's saying there is that there was at least 120,000 children that did not know between their left hand and their right hand. So in order to judge the population of the city, we could safely say, according to that verse, that there was 120, if there was 120,000 babies or little children that didn't know the difference in their right hand and their left hand, there was a lot of people, a lot of souls in the city of Nineveh. Not only that, but fourthly, we see in this chapter three that Nineveh was great in its salvation. God did an amazing work in the city of Nineveh. God's words in chapter four, verse 11 was that he spared Nineveh, which we would also use that in, in, in synonymous with salvation. When you and I got saved, he spared us from hell, amen. amen. He saved us from an eternal destiny away from God. God did an amazing work in the city of Nineveh. Now my question tonight is why would God spare Nineveh? Why would God decide to show up and do something amazing in the city of Nineveh? And what is it that would cause God to perform such an act of mercy and salvation on this city? Well, let me say this. The same things that he still requires today to save our nation. The very same things that Nineveh needed to do in chapter number three to experience God sparing them, God saving them from wrath and from judgment, or as he said in verse four, from being overthrown, is the same thing God's looking for today, not only in our nation, but looking in us as individuals. The exact same thing that caused God to spare Nineveh will cause God to spare America. I couldn't help but notice as I was just in my mind comparing the city of Nineveh with the country of America. According to Genesis chapter number 10, Nineveh was founded, it was a capital city of Assyria at the time, it was founded by a man named Nimrod. You find that in Genesis 10, you don't have to turn over there. I was researching it some this afternoon, I don't wanna to get too bogged down because it's not really part of my message, but I was just comparing America with Nineveh. Nineveh was founded by a man named Nimrod who was the son of a man named Cush. Cush was the son of Ham, who was the son of Noah. So Nimrod's granddaddy, we know was Ham, who the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms was cursed by God. There was a curse attached to that family. There was a curse attached to that man for the sin, the Bible says, that which he did unto his father Noah. We don't know exactly what he did. The Bible doesn't go into specifics. I've seen men try to explain it, men try to tell us what he did. The Bible doesn't tell us what Ham did, but the Bible says that when Noah awoke from his drunkenness and realized what his son had done unto him, he did something to his dad. As his dad Noah, after the flood, was laying there drunk on the bed, and the Bible tells us that he went out, Ham did, and told his other two brethren, Shem and Japheth, and the Bible says that they went in backwards and covered the nakedness of their father and because of what Ham did, and again, we don't know exactly what he did, but whatever it was, it was enough to incur the wrath of God and God cursed Ham because of what he did to his father. Well, that is Nimrod's granddaddy. That's the lineage of Nimrod. The Bible tells us Nimrod was also the one that founded Babel. The Tower of Babel, you know that they were gonna build a tower to defy God and to make a name for themselves. And apparently Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter in that day, he was a founder of cities. And one of the cities that was founded under his jurisdiction or under his authority, the Bible tells us right there in Genesis 10, it was Nineveh. Well, you contrast that with the founding of America. I mean, Nineveh was founded by a man 
that had come from a cursed lineage. I mean, I, I, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but if you research it much at all, you'll find most people agree that Nimrod was such a wicked man, he married his own mother. And was probably the founder of Baal religion, if you go and you study it out. And I have, and I don't get too bogged down on stuff that's not biblical because it could just be what somebody thinks or somebody says, but anywhere you study it, you will find out Nimrod was married to his own mother. Wicked, filthy, vile creature. And started these cities. Well, you contrast that to America that was founded on biblical principles founded on God, founded on the word of God. And you look at the Nineveh and you contrast it with America, a place where there's still even today, uh, hundreds of years later, still a remnant that fears God and believes God, still believes the word of God, still preaches the truth of the word of God, still looks at God as our guide and as our heavenly father. That's a sharp contrast from Nineveh. A lot of people don't believe God could revive America. They don't believe God could spare America and I believe anything that we're seeing right now in our country, if nothing else, is the judgment of God. Amen. And I pray this every day when I pray, Lord, we don't deserve it, but please be merciful to us. I pray it every time we have an election, Lord, we don't deserve, uh, we don't deserve to be spared. We don't deserve uh, to be spared uh, from the curse of having a baby killing socialist in the White House, but please be merciful to us and please don't let a pro-abortion socialist be in the White House. Please, God, please be merciful to us. We don't deserve it, but please. That's how I pray, that's how you ought to pray, by the way. And yet, People say, I don't believe God could ever revive, do a work of revival in America. I don't believe God could do a work in Baltimore. Well, God did a work in Nineveh. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. And let's just be honest, we got more going for us than they did. Amen. We, got, we got more going for us in the fact that we've got at least a small hand few of Bible believer Christians in the city of Baltimore. There might not be a whole, whole lot, but there's more than there was in Nineveh. Amen. Did you know God was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for just 10, 10 righteous. Because you know the story when, God, when Abraham was talking to the Lord and he found out God was gonna judge Sodom because he knew Lot and his family was there. I think he started at what, at 40 or 50 and started working his way down and he got to 10. He should have kept going because there wasn't 10. But God said, plain as day, in Genesis chapter number 18, verse number 32, he said, I will spare I will not, I will, I will save Sodom and Gomorrah from fire and brimstone if there's just 10 righteous in the city. So I believe if you look at, a, if you look at God's track record, there's hope for Baltimore, Maryland. There's hope for America. I believe that with all my heart. A lot of people are washing their hands and saying it's over, it's done, and they're waiting for the rapture. But I'm telling you right now, God could still do something in this city. You know what it's going to take? Same thing it took for Nineveh. The same thing it's going to take for God to bring revival into Baltimore, into Dundalk. It's going to take the same thing that happened in Nineveh. I'm going to give them to you right quick. Three main points. I've got quite a few sub points. They won't be on the screen. I'll just give you the three main points on the screen. But I'm going to give you some things tonight that God showed me out of Jonah chapter number three. Number one, God spared Nineveh, first of all, because they were receptive. They were receptive. They were receptive. God is always impressed with someone that is receptive Amen. to what it is he's trying to say and do. Amen. Three things about them being receptive that I want you to notice in our text. They were receptive to God's man. The Bible tells us in verse number four, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They were receptive to God's man. Now, I think it's important that we understand this, and I think we know this, but I want to remind you, Jonah was not a spiritual man. He was a prophet. He was a mouthpiece for God. But if you read Jonah, you'll find out Jonah was not a very spiritual man. He didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. He ran in the opposite direction from where God told him to go and God had to make him spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth in the whale's belly with his head wrapped up in seaweed for him to repent and get right with God. He went into the city, preached what God told him to preach and then you get to the first part of chapter number four and when revival broke out, Jonah got mad at God for it. He wasn't really a spiritual man but they still received God's man. Why? Because 
He was God's man. It's amazing a lot of times, and listen, I'm a preacher, so I'm walking on thin ice here. I know what I'm about to say. There's a lot of people that won't listen to the message because they don't like the man. You'd be wise to listen to the message if it comes from the word of God. Forget who it is that's saying it necessarily and listen to what God's got to say. I'm not saying that men of God shouldn't live right and holy and godly lives. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I believe with all of my heart that the man of God should be a clean vessel that God can use. But my point is this, maybe God was merciful to Nineveh because instead of nitpicking the preacher, maybe they listened to what he had to say. Receptive to God's man. Number two, they were receptive to God's message. The Bible says... In verse number five, so the people of Nineveh believed God. What about that? They believed God. It's interesting because when you get over to Matthew chapter number 12, Jesus actually commended Nineveh. He commended them when he was talking to the nation of Israel. I want to read this to you. You don't have to turn over there if you don't want to, but it's Matthew chapter 12, verse number 41. Jesus said this about about the nation of the, of the city of Nineveh when he was talking to the, uh, the people of Israel. Here's what he said. They said in, in uh, Matthew 12, verse 38, certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto you but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Look at verse 41. And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. <laughs> and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Jesus looked at the nation of Israel and said, if Nineveh was here, they would be preaching to you and rebuking you because someone greater than Jonah is here preaching and you won't even believe what I'm saying and yet they listened and believed what Jonah was preaching. They were receptive to God's man. They were receptive to God's message. By the way, let me just go back to what I was talking about just a minute, receptive to God's man. I can remember a time when people used to have respect for a preacher. Yes, sir. Amen. They don't respect a preacher much anymore. That's exactly right. It's sad. And a lot of it we've brought on ourselves with all the scandals and all the, all the crooks and all the sexual perverts and all the... Uh, all the, uh, the, the, the money stealers and all the, uh, the money hungry preachers that are uh, in pulpits across this country, but not everybody's like that. Amen. Not everybody's like that. But I can tell you there was a day and age when they used to have respect for the man of God. If they knew somebody was a preacher, they wouldn't cuss around him. That's right. They'd watch their language. Amen. I remember years ago they'd say, I'm sorry, Reverend, excuse my French. Now, they don't care if, they, if you're a preacher, they'll cuss you to your face. Here was a city of Nineveh received a preacher. And by the way, we could get into what he looked like after spending three days and three nights in the, in the stomach of that whale. Anybody knows anything at all about medicine, knows anything about science, knows that when he come, when that whale spit him out, after being three days in that stomach and being surrounded by that bile and all those digestive juices that was in that whale's stomach, he was probably a yellow color. His hair was probably gone or patched or, or fallen out. They don't tell him what his clothes look like. And here he is walking up and down the street, looks like something from Mars, preaching. And they received him. And they received his message. Hey, that goes a long way with God. When God sends a mouthpiece to a, to a people and they disregard it, that's a quick way to get on God's bad side. But when you start listening to the messenger, because God has chosen, and don't ask me why, but God has chosen in his sovereignty to use men to be carriers of his message. He could have easily sent down angels. He could have easily wrote the gospel in the constellations. He could have easily put John 3.16 on the back of the leaves. He could have very easily found an alternative way to get his message across, but God has chosen to get his message to a world through men, through preachers, through men of God. It's an overwhelming responsibility, but that's the way God designed for it to be. They were receptive to God's man. They were receptive to God's message and they were receptive to God's mandate. The mandate was yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. They could have been like the people of Noah's day and say, well, we'll just wait and see, won't we? Which is exactly what they did in, Lot's, in, in Noah's day. 
Noah said, it's gonna rain, it's gonna flood. And he put his family together and got all the animals on the ark. God left the door open for seven days. And for seven days, not one person got on that ark. What were they saying? We don't believe it's gonna happen. We'll just wait and see. Well, when God shut the door and the fountains of the deep were broken up and it began to rain, it was too late then. The city of Nineveh could have easily done that. 40 days, all right, y'all, set your clock. Let's see what happens. The king could have said, he could have sent spies out and said, go out and see if there are any nations uh, gathering their armies up. See if there's anybody marching to overthrow us. He could have easily done a hundred other things, but no, they believed God. They, re they received his man. They received his message and they received his mandate. Can I say this? It's important. When, you're, when we're talking about revival, it's important to come to God on God's terms. God says 40 days and it's gonna be overthrown. He meant 40 days and it's gonna be overthrown. A lot of people choose to wait 40 days to see what happens. They decide to use those 40 days to get right with God. Here's the problem. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. I got a funny feeling if, and of course we don't even know, even the Bible says even the Son of Man doesn't know the day or the hour. If you hear some religious scholar, some TV evangelist tell you when Jesus is coming back, mark it down, they're lying. Even Jesus don't know when he's coming back. Jesus said that with his own mouth. Only the Father knoweth the day or the hour that he will bring the church home. But if for some reason we could get it nailed down, and I mean it was in concrete, and we knew that Jesus was coming back in 40 days. Can you imagine walking through the streets of Baltimore saying you got 40 days to get right with God? What do you reckon the overall response would be? They'd think, they'd think we lost our mind. Tell somebody coronavirus is coming and everybody all of a sudden wants to do, get prepared. Tell them Jesus is coming it goes in one ear and out the other. Amen. They were receptive. That's one reason why God spared Nineveh. Number two, write this down. They were remorseful. The Bible tells us in chapter three, verse number five down through verse number eight, they demonstrated what Paul called godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. Somebody's phone's ringing. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow, Paul said, worketh repentance. There's a difference in just being feeling sorry because you got caught right. and being sorry because all of a sudden it's getting real to you, the seriousness of what you've done. And the Bible tells us they demonstrated, and I'm going to show it to you, they demonstrated true remorse, true sorrow. It affected their position. Look at verse number six. The Bible says, uh, that the king, uh, word came into the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne. Seems like I just preached something about that out of Isaiah chapter number six. Before you could see the Lord high and lifted up, your king's got to die. And the problem is with a lot of us, the king is us. We're the ones sitting on the throne. We're the ones calling the shots. Boy, I'd like to have a dollar for every time somebody said, well, preacher, I just don't believe that. Well, that don't, mean, that don't mean anything. Preacher, I just don't see it that way. Well, I'm sorry you don't, but that don't change the truth. Right. Don't change the word of God. Well, preacher, I didn't like that. Sorry you didn't like it, but that doesn't change the fact. What's the problem? People are sitting on the throne. That's right. That's right. They're an authority unto themselves. What they see, what they think, and how they feel, and what they believe, and their reasoning and their logic takes precedent over God. Guess what happened when they got remorseful? The king come down off of his throne. And by the way, that's the first thing you're gonna have to do. That's the first thing I'm gonna have to do if we're gonna experience revival. Right. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. It's right. exactly right. God resisteth the proud, James says. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. He said in another place in James, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and God will exalt you in due time. The secret many times to experience in revival is we're gonna to have to get humble. It affected their position. The king arose from his throne. Not only did it affect, I'm talking about the remorse. Not only did it affect their position, it affected their pretense. The Bible said in verse number six, he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him. What's it saying? He removed all pretenses of importance, all, preten all coverings, all facades, all the masks came off. 
He looked just like a regular man off that throne with that robe laid off. It's amazing what we shroud ourselves in many times when we try to impress God. It's amazing how we try to impress God with our spirituality and with our, our church membership. We even try to impress God sometimes with our ministry involvement. But Lord, but Lord, no, maybe you need to get off the throne and take the robe off and just get real with God. I tell you, America, God's blessed this country. But I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again for this country to experience revival. God's about to bring this country to its knees. He could be doing it right now. He could be doing it right now. And I'm going to say this too, knowing full well what I'm about to say. If God would break, if a revival would break out in America over this coronavirus, I say bring it on. Amen. 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 If it's what it takes, if it takes an economic decline, if it takes everybody not being able to go to their ball games and everybody not being able to go to the stadiums on Sunday, if there's no place for people to go but to God, I say bring it on. God might be bringing this country to its knees. Amen. One final act to give us, is everybody still with me? A chance to get right with God. I believe that with all my heart. We're just like the church of Laodicea. We're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Yes, sir. We waste more money than most of the world makes. Amen. We throw away more food than most of the world eats. We complain and murmur and grumble more than anybody else. I've been all over the world. I've been to third world countries all over the globe and we complain and murmur and grumble more than any place I've ever been. American Christians are more full of apathy and laziness and carnality and worldliness than any church I've been to in any place in the world. Amen. I heard, I heard this, this really happened. Heard about an evangelist that was preaching at a church and the pastor was sitting behind him. Preacher was, an evangelist was preaching and the pastor, he leaned up and he said, feed my sheep. And the evangelist kept preaching. He was just pouring his heart out and the preacher leaned in and said, feed my sheep. And the evangelist kept preaching, kept preaching. The evangelist said, feed my sheep. And finally the evangelist turned around and looked at the preacher. He said, there's a fool. Now you can't see their eyes. We hear more truth in a week that most of the world hears in a lifetime. Amen. Oh, yeah. People come to church and go to sleep. Yes, sir. Amen. It's amazing. Beats all I've ever seen. God might want us to take the robe off. God might want us, can I just say it? God might want us to just get naked before him. Just get real. Nothing between us, no pretenses, right. no, no, uh, no self, uh, no self uh, uh, reliance, nothing whatsoever. Just come before God and get real. That's what God's looking for. Amen. It affected their position, affected their pretenses. It affected their priorities. In verse number seven, they went all of a sudden, they weren't worried about food. It's, it's, it's hilarious. We've shut down ball stadiums. We've shut down ball leagues. We've shut down championships. We've closed our churches. We've closed, uh, we've closed just about everything. And somebody said something today, said it's getting so bad now, they're talking about shutting down the restaurants. I said, well, you think? I mean, that's how bad it's getting. Right. That the last thing to close is restaurants where people go in places and eat. And their germs are all over everything. Maybe we ought to close the restaurants. You know what they did? In Nineveh, they shut down the restaurants. They shut down the grocery stores. For, for the first time, people were not preoccupied with the, what they were gonna eat and what they were gonna drink. Didn't matter. You know it's getting real when people quit thinking about their belly. All of a sudden, they weren't worried about food and water the king said in verse number seven, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Watch this. Let them not feed nor drink water. That's pretty serious. Yeah. Brother Roth and I have been meeting, talking about this prayer ministry. He's got several ideas. He's wanting to run by me and we're just talking about this prayer ministry and all the ways that our church could get involved in prayer. And he's come to me a couple times. He said, maybe, maybe we could encourage the people of God to fast one meal on Sunday. They didn't even drink water. 
they wouldn't even feed their dogs or let their dogs drink water. It's getting quiet now. They, 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 they left the animals in the stalls. Oh, it's getting serious now. Oh my goodness, preacher. That's, that's, that's pretty bad. No, what's bad is in 40 days, the whole city is gonna be overthrown. Then that's when it gets bad. Not eating and not drinking ain't nothing. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Well, we're just trying not to get overthrown. We might need to do something drastic, like change our priorities. It affected their priorities. It affected their possessions, even their beasts, their herds, their flocks were impacted. You know revival is about to break out when people's getting right with God affects what they own. Right. Only in America could we pray for revival and rob God with our tithes at the same time. Only in America, only in America could the Christians come in this altar and kneel down and pray for God to send revival to our churches and send revival to America and then go back to their pew with their hands in their pockets when they pass the plate. Only in America would you see something that far-fetched. But I'll tell you what it did. It affected their possessions. It didn't just affect them. It affected everything they owned. Now we're getting somewhere. I'm trying to preach, but you ought to see some of the looks I'm getting. If you don't tithe, you're under a curse. That's right. yes, sir. I can't believe the people ask me to pray for them and they're under a curse and I know they're under a curse. They just don't know I know that they're under a curse, but I know. Please pray for me. I ain't praying for you. You're under a curse. Read your Bible. And until they got right with God, everything they own was affected. Is everybody still with me? Number five, it affected their publications. Look at verse number seven. Boy, I noticed this because I like to write books. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the kings and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. If you were to go by the newspaper stands, they weren't talking about sports. They weren't writing about the stock market. <laughs> Are you with me? You know what the publications of the day said? Get right with God. Everybody fast, everybody pray, everybody get serious about your sin, everybody get right with God. That's what the publications headlines were in Nineveh. Boy, could you imagine a Newsweek or a Time magazine? Boy, they like to get creative, don't they? Imagine if you just got a Time magazine, a Newsweek magazine, and right on the front it just said, oh God, please revive us. And you was to flip through there, and instead of having all the quotes, instead of having all the articles, instead of having all the liberals and their perspective and all the craziness and all the Hollywood updates, if it just went down through there and told you how to get right with God, that was what the publications were in Nineveh Amen. after Jonah got there. They didn't just proclaim it verbally, they published it everywhere. I mean, there was posters on the trees. Fast, pray, get right with God. Beg God for mercy. It was everywhere. And you can't hardly even get an anti-abortion commercial on, the, on Super Bowl Sunday on the television. You know I'm telling the truth. They were receptive. They were remorseful, broken. I really believe the secret to revival is we're going to have to get broken. We're going to have to get to the place to where it bothers us. Thirdly, write this down. They were repentant. They were repentant. The Bible says in verse 8, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mildly to God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way. Three things I noticed about their repentance that changed their attitude. The Bible says they cried mightily unto God. Now, I'm going to be careful because I don't want to discourage those of you from praying that pray quietly. There's a time and a place to pray quietly. But I'm just going to be honest with you. In, the, in Nineveh, when they was praying, it wasn't under their breath. Right. 
they weren't just praying in their heart. They prayed mildly. I believe those people were crying out to God. I believe they were being vocal. I believe they were breaking a sweat. And I believe it lasted more than 30, 45 seconds. Somebody said to me, they said, Preacher, I don't understand how, I, I that's all I can do to preach, pray for five minutes. Man, it takes me longer than that to get right with God when I pray. Right. It takes me longer than that to feel like I can clear the lines of communication. Don't look at me like that. If I regard iniquity in my heart, he said, the Lord will not hear me. I mean, we're going to have to get right with God before we can even pray. Amen. A lot of people jump down, start asking God for stuff and leave and never even spend time confessing their sin. And I could pray five minutes and, and, and never even get started, feeling like I'm getting the inroad. And you start praying for your family, you start praying for your wife and your kids. I don't know if I've got time for that. Job offered up sacrifices every day for his kids, and he had 10 of them. How long you reckon that took? I'm talking about these people cried mightily unto God. I mean, they turned the television off. They turned their cell phones off and they got along with God and they wept and they cried mightily unto God. Hey, God's listening. God's looking. Right. He said, if my people will humble themselves and pray, it's a big if in some cases, isn't it? It's a big if. Changed their attitude. They cried mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way. It changed their attitude. It changed their actions. There's a group of people today call themselves Baptists that don't believe in repentance. Amen. I don't even know how that's possible. I've been trying to get my head wrapped around it. To them, repentance is almost a dirty word. The Bible says turn from, turn from idols. They turn from idols to serve the living God. You can't get saved unless you repent. Right. Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist yeah. preached repentance. Paul preached repentance. In fact, the Bible said God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If it's God's will for people to repent, how can you not preach repentance? Amen. Are you adding works of salvation? No, I'm not. You're taking repentance out of salvation by not preaching on it. Right. Or well, you're basically saying that you gotta stop sinning before you can get saved. I didn't say that. I said you gotta turn to God before you can be saved. Turn from and turn to. That's what repentance is. I didn't come up with a doctrine of repentance and so it ain't up to me to explain it or justify it. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They preach it in the Old Testament and they preach it in the New Testament. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You're adding works of salvation. No, I'm not. I'm surprised somebody said you ain't adding works of salvation by believing that you've got to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. If you want to get technical, I guess that's a work. I mean, we got Baptists that don't believe in repentance. They will fall out with you about it. They will rip your face off for preaching repentance. They will throw your tracks in the trash if it has the word repentance on the back of the track. The Bible said in the book of Acts that for a while God winked at their ignorance, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Right. I don't know how you get around that. Amen. We got people today getting saved, but they're not repenting. And that's why there's no change in their life. There's no transformation at all. They live just like they did. They look just like they did. They act just like they did. Nothing changes. I'm gonna tell you why nothing changed because they didn't repent. They didn't turn from anything when they turned to God. You can't have the world and God at the same time. You've got to let go. No man can serve two masters. The Bible said in the book of 1 John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I don't know how you get around that. That's not preaching work salvation. That's preaching repentance. It changed their attitude. It changed their actions. The king, this king, this heathen, pagan king, king that had never gone to a sore the Lord conference, never read his Bible, never been to church one time. He believed more in repentance than people do today. That's right. He published it and proclaimed it in the streets to turn 
to God, everyone from his evil way. That's in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Again, I keep going back to that verse. That's perfect formula for revival. Pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. That's, where, that's, the, that's the kink in the cog right there. Right. Amen. Pastor Shiflett, I know my liberty is in Christ. I know I've got liberty. I've got liberty. I, I love it when somebody's been saved five years and the only Bible verse they know is judge not and I've got liberty. That's the only thing they know. Right. They don't know anything else in there. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, Titus 2, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. That's Bible. Amen. That ain't Pastor Schiff's philosophy. That's not Calvary Baptist Church's creed. That's the word of God. And I'm going to tell you what happened, what's happening to all these big churches is they're filling up with lost people because they don't preach that they got to turn from anything. And it's evident that they haven't turned from anything. Their repentance changed their attitude, it changed their actions, and thirdly, it changed God's anger. Look at verse number nine. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil. What about that? God repented when they did. Hey, like them apples. When they repented, God repented. God said, I'm gonna overthrow you. They said, please don't, we're sorry. He said, okay, I think I won't. We were lost, born, lost, and on our way to hell. And we prayed and asked God to save us. He changed our eternal destiny. They were about to be overthrown. They were about to be destroyed. And we don't know how it was gonna happen. God could have sent a tornado in there. He could have sent uh, enemy f forces in there. He could have rained down fire. I don't tell him what he could have done. It doesn't matter. The Bible says that they believed God and they repented in sackcloth and ashes and they turned from their sin and God saw their works. Yeah. Oh my goodness. God saw their works. Oh, you're preaching work salvation? No. They had faith in verse five. Stay with me now. It starts out, they believe God. But James says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. God saw their faith and he saw their works. Sure he did. <laughs> we want faith that doesn't produce any works. And I'm gonna say this, it's bad English, but I'm gonna say it. There ain't no such thing as faith that doesn't produce works. Faith will produce works. <laughs> Is everybody okay? Am I adding works of salvation? Absolutely not. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created under, created, created under Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, I thought you said it wasn't. No, you ain't listening. Not of works, lest any man should boast, but we've been created unto good works. God says, I don't, you're not gonna get saved by your works, but when you get saved, there will be good works. I don't understand why that's so complicated. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. Yes, amen. And now you're judging. I'm not judging. I'm just looking at the fruit on your tree. Just observing. You get it hanging out there for everybody to see. I'm just calling it like I see it. They came to, they came to, they came to John the Baptist and said, baptize us. He said, why don't you go get right with God and bring me some fruit and meat for repentance. Then we'll talk about baptism. Is everybody okay? This is rare here in this kind of preaching anymore. This goes over like a lead balloon in most places. Well, Pastor Shifflett, I just believe in being saved by faith. I believe in being saved by faith. I believe even Old Testament saints were saved by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. 
God saw Abraham's faith and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Right. Noah was saved by faith. He wasn't saved by works, but he had good works. Abraham was saved by faith, but he proved it by doing what God said. The Bible says they believe God in verse number five and verse number 10 says God saw their works. <laughs> Man, this is good stuff right here. This will get you run off a lot of places. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil which he had said he would do unto them and he did it not. What about that? It's almost like God said, you go first. You repent and I will. You repent of your evil, then I repent of mine. It's up to you. He's still saying that, by the way. Somebody rebuked me today on social media. I don't even follow anybody on social media. I still get rebuked. Because I posted something about preaching in Myanmar out of 2 Chronicles seven fourteen on revival. That was on that Sunday morning at that little Gospel Baptist church. I preached on 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. Remember that? And the altars was just packed. Oh, that was to Israel. That ain't for the church. Oh, shut up. I know good and well it was too. It was to Israel in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. But when you get over to the New Testament, we are his people. Right. Right. In times past, we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. Right. Yes. Yes. So if he's talking to his people in 2 Chronicles, I reckon he might work for me yes. in 2020. You love it. I love it when some bimbo wants to wax eloquent about something they have no idea what they're talking about. You think I don't know 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is talking to the nation of Israel? Of course I know that. Anybody in third grade knows that. But the formula for revival that's found in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 still works in the New Testament. You got to pray. You got to seek his face. You got to turn from your wicked ways. Then he said he would heal you. Amen. Read James. Confess your faults to one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's right. oh, yeah. It's all in there. Secret to revival is getting right with God. Amen. I don't care what generation you're in. God, and listen, this is what I, I mean, I almost wept this evening as I was standing right here and I read chapter four. Look what Jonah said, carnal devil. Look at what he said in chapter four, verse number two. Oh, the Bible said in verse one, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Could you imagine revival breaking out in Baltimore and a preacher getting mad about it? I can't believe God's doing this. They're believing God. They're receiving the message. They're, they're, they're in sackcloth and ashes and they're, and they're fasting and praying and crying mildly unto God. I can't believe these people. It displeased Jonah. Boy, he's got some serious issues. He was very angry. He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord. Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. What a spiritual giant. Lord, I knew, I knew before I left home, I knew good and well if I came over here and preached to these people that they was going to have revival. I knew you was going to be merciful to them. I can't take it no more. Would you just kill me? Just kill me. Just kill me. God's got a reputation of being slow to anger, Amen. gracious and merciful and of great kindness and repentant of the evil that he was going to do. And here's what I want to say tonight. I'm done. If God would spare Nineveh, you think he would spare Baltimore? You think he could spare America? You think he could spare Maryland? You think he could spare Dundalk? Mm -hmm. When he sees that right there. When we get receptive and remorseful and repentant, we're liable to see it. I don't know what the people down the street's going to do, but I know what I'm going to do. Amen. I'm going to do that right there. And I'm going to pray and ask God for mercy. I told my wife that day, I said, our kids are going to grow up in a country that look nothing like the country I grew up in. 
George, my grandkids, your grandkids, what, what, are they gonna, what, what kind of America are they going to live in? Can I say this? It's up to us. What kind of country they, they grow up in. The remnant has always held the key to the heart of God. Read Isaiah 1 when you get home and tell me God don't hold back his wrath just because of the remnant. Little hand few. God said, I would have wiped out the whole place, but there was a remnant. So in Isaiah 1, read it when you get home. Just start reading in chapter 1. Look at how bad it was. Look how he described them. Like a open, open wounds and rotten sores and just, just filthy nastiness. But there was a remnant that held back the wrath of God. Amen. That's you, that's me, that's us. We've got to do that right there. Father, we come to you this evening on behalf of our nation. It's a national day of prayer. Our president has called for a national day of prayer and Lord, we need it. We need it. I pray that you would look down today and see enough, enough Christians praying. 